to East Tennessee State head coach Steve Forbes, the head coach of the men's basketball team, winners of 12 of their last 13 games. Uh, you've got to be pleased here this past week as you go and prepare to play yet another first place showdown, this time on the road at Furman on Thursday. But, but uh, a 10-point victory really coming on in the second half against Greensboro on Thursday. And then this Saturday, coming on again in the second half against VMI, really doubling their score. Uh, it, it seems like, I mean, very you know, what is the reason why you've been playing so well and just putting teams away here this past week in the second half, Coach Steve Forbes? Well, you know, Mark, I think a lot of that has to do with our depth. You know, yep. We have a lot of guys that can play, and that well was proven on Thursday and Saturday. We won by a very large margin on Saturday, and it didn't have Jalen McLeod even in the lineup. He was home for a funeral. A lot of teams probably couldn't survive having their number two four not play, you know, and we were able to do that. And so I think that in itself is a big plus for us. And I think this team has found its identity defensively. And we're making it awfully hard for other teams to score. And when you can do that and then go down and shoot the ball at a pretty high rate, high rate like we've been doing in league play, then you know, you're going to be awfully tough to beat. Well, I know in your 89-48 to 48 victory against the Kedets, uh, that the Kedets, or as they historically were called, the running ruse, uh, shot only 26% from the uh, floor, uh, totally dominated in the paint. Now, VMI, you know, this is a team that is picked to finish last in the Southern Conference, right. but I wanted to talk, and you mentioned this before, about Jermaine Long's just wonderful day, really limiting Francis Alonzo of Greensboro, or UNCG as they prefer to be called, to only 10 points. He was averaging 18 coming into the game. We've talked about his talents. Uh, he's one of the best, yeah. if not the best players in the overall SOCON. Uh, I know you wanted to prevent Alonzo from being open on the right side of the court. You thought that was his stronger side shooting. But how did Long do that? Well, it takes tremendous effort, you know. And, and if you, there's a couple clips I have on tape that I showed our team where he just, you know, just showed tremendous conditioning, mental toughness, you know, to move with, throughout the possession. Because it's not like Alonzo, you know, cuts once or twice and then he shoots it. It's three, four, five, six cuts. And, and those guys and his teammates are really good at getting him open. And, they're, you know, they do a great job of screening for him. And so you, not only do you got to be able to move with him, but then you got to be able to, you know, to get through the screen. And uh, I thought Jermaine was really on point with that. And, you know, yeah, if we could force him to that side of the court, you know, that was the more lower percentages of his shots go in. Not that they don't go in, but the lower percentage. And so try to play some percentages sometimes as well, basketball. And, um, I just thought it was a great effort. And I have a lot of respect for Alonzo. I think, you know, in my opinion, I think he's the best player in our league. But that's my opinion, not everybody's. But I think he's a really good player. And I think he's really hard to guard. No, I agree with you. I mean, I recall watching him play last year against, and you just, you know, hand in the face and he's still making the shot. If you just go leave him open for a millisecond, it seems like he's going to drop it. But he was not open because of Jermaine Long much on Thursday. The other thing in that game that I saw that I was really impressed with was your team's ability to break out of a trapping offense, or excuse me, a de trapping defense, uh, again, that UNCG would uh, implement. It would seem like they'd put two guys on a guard, and consistently the guard would then leap up and find the open man who would then convert the shot and such. Uh, what's the key to break to breaking that trap? You seem to do it so well, well against the Spartans. You, you have to attack. You know, I think what happens with a lot of teams against pressure like that, they, they beat the trap, and then they try to set something up, run a play, they don't attack. You know, like you just said, if there's two guys guarding one, and that tells me, and I'm not very good at math because I got a history degree, but <laughs> but if, if, if it's two two guys guarding one, then we have the advantage coming out of the trap. You know, and so our guys, you know, we attack. Once, and we have the link, you know, DeSante to get up over that trap. And because they put their foreman up on the ball, I had Dickie or someone else. 
you know, a taller six nine guy up there trapped, it's harder to throw over the top, but he can do it. And then once you throw over, you have to attack. You can't just walk it up. And I thought we did a really good job of flowing into what we were doing. Well, whatever it was we had called. I thought we did a good job. And and they press out and do a good job of, you know, defending the three point line because of that pressure and they played zone. So we did a really good job, I thought, of attacking the basket, which I thought was really important. Can I ask, uh, quite candidly, VMI has struggled, it seems, a lot on the hardwood, really since the mid-70s. In the mid-70s, the Keydets were a nationally ranked program, but uh, since then, it hasn't been much. Uh, I don't really have a problem with them in the Southern Conference because they've been there for so long, dating back, uh, although not consecutively, but dating back to the 30s. And plus, there is a nice rivalry there with the Citadel, the two military academies. But I got to ask you, do you think that VMI is sort of an anchor and it holds down the Southern Conference? Well, I don't want to put that on anybody, you know. Sure. That's why I asked the question there, Coach. But yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think I think that you know they have their they have their um, disadvantages of, of you know being in a situation where you know it's a military school, it's a tough life, you know, it's not for everybody, and so uh, you know they they are challenged in that respect, and you know they uh, but they do but you got to remember too, it's um it's not just a basketball league, it's also a football league, sure. baseball league, and you know there's a lot of other volleyball and, and well they probably don't play that, but. <laughs> But to have those guys in the in the football and back baseball is very important, I'm sure, to our league. And so, you know, yeah, if I took off my – if I – in a perfect world, you know, I, I'd throw two teams out there like maybe Charleston or Belmont, you know, to add to our league. Those guys for basketball would make our league well, – would probably make our league a too good league. The – that's – yeah, that's a very good point. I, I know that right now – I'm looking at TeamRankings.com. They have you projected as an 11 seed to the tournament, and I know you don't. It's too early for this, you know, and all. Yeah. But there is, there are making a 52 percent chance of you making the tournament, and that's not all by winning the Southern Conference tournament. There is actually, you know, this is what you could do as an at large. Right now, I think you're ranked 59th by Ken Pomeroy. Uh, I'm, do you think that there is a chance that maybe this could be the year that the SOCON gets two bids? I know you want to win the Southern Conference Tournament, don't get me wrong, but Wofford beats North Carolina. Uh, could this possibly be a year in which the Southern Conference could get uh, that attention? I think I think we are, but it's because I think, let's just say we went undefeated in the league and we weren't lost in the championship. That still would be five losses, and we don't have a top... 25 win or a top 50 win probably you know we, we heard our opportunity was to beat Xavier you know and that and that, that would have been that would have helped that, that would have been a huge win I think not having one of those kind of wins um, I wouldn't want to take my chances I'll put it to you like that um, sure it's unfortunate it's unfortunate you know because if you did something like that if you know best case scenario you won all your games and then lost the championship and didn't make a tournament I think that would be a pretty devastating well, one of the highlights against VMI also was that uh, DeSanta Bradley scored his 1,000th point. He had 14 points yeah. in the game. Uh, can you tell me a little about the contributions, if you would? Uh, speak to me about Bradley. What he means to this team? Well, DeSanta, you know, he, um, he, does, a, he does a lot of it. He does a lot of things for our team. He's got great size and length. He can handle the ball. He can score from the three-point line. He can drive it to the basket and finish. Um, shoots good free. He's a good free throw shooter. He's become um, a good, very good defender. He can rebound from his position. He can do a lot of things. And um, I think he's one of the better players in our league. I, I've said that since the beginning you know, of the year. Where DeSante's come a long ways since I've had him. I've had him three years now. Is he's become more of a vocal player, more of a leader. Um, it's not really in his nature. He's a pretty quiet kid, pretty hum very humble young man, but it's just not in his nature to, to be, you know, be very to communicate uh, verbally a lot, and he's gotten way better at that. And so he does a lot of things for our team. And if you look at our stats, he leads us in a lot of categories, and so he's a very uh, integral part of what we're doing. I think that, um, you know, score a 1,000 points in your career is a tremendous accomplishment. And, you know, since I've been here, we've had – 
you know, AJ did it, TJ did it in two years, and now it's something, you know, in four years. Well, another play uh, circumstance, and I want to get to uh, your dominance in the paint against VMI, and really against UNCG as well. I know you made the switch from Peter Jerk, and had been playing pretty well. I think he led all scorers uh, with nine points yeah. in the ball game against uh, in the first half against UNCG, and then you go to the wide body. You replace the senior with the freshman and uh, Mladen Armas, who you know is a, a little bit thicker, if you will, than uh, Jerkin and. I, Arma scored nine points in the second half himself and did a very good job of keeping uh, everybody out of the paint. Seems like you're you're dominating here, but I, I just wanted to ask, what does Armas as a wide body give you that maybe Jerk and the Indiana transfer does not? Well, it is, you know, physicality. Mm -hmm. It was a rough and tumble game, and, you know, it was like, you know, we were, they were letting us play, and there was a lot of contact, and I think, too, when you're big like that, when you're seven foot, Yeah. The pace of the, the pace of that game and the physicality of that game, that's that's what we needed. And you know, like you said, Peter's been he's been at a really high level all year long and a lot and gets better and better and better every game. And to have that one two punch at the five is a big is a is a, is a big advantage for us. And uh, I feel like um Peter is a is a better offensive player than Milan. And I think Milan is a better defensive player than Peter right now. Now, that doesn't mean you want, you can't score. Like, Milan can score and Peter can play defense, but they both have their strengths and weaknesses. And, and so we try to, we try to play them based on the situation as far as the game's concerned. And if we need, to, you know, we feel like we just need to string together more stops, then maybe Milan gets a little bit more playing time when we need to score. And, you know, maybe Peter gets a little bit more, but it just kind of depends game to game how they're doing. Well, before I want to talk to you and ask you about Furman, I want to ask you about a story that I saw yesterday, and it is that there's talk that the NCAA is going to meet soon about immediate eligibility for transfers. And uh, the rumor is that if a player transferred, let's say Patrick Good, transferred uh, to a school and he had a 2.7 or 2.8 GPA, he would be eligible immediately. There's even some talk that this rule could get in effect as soon as August the 1st, 2018. First question, it's a two-parter. Have you heard about this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've heard about it. It's been discussed uh, even, you know, the last, probably about the last year, you know, amongst coaches and our compliance people that this is, this is something that's being considered. So I haven't looked at the, the exact language of it. Um, you know, I've heard about the, the GPA uh, requirement. Um, I, I haven't looked at all of it, but, you know, obviously I'm kind of mixed on it, to be honest with you. You know, it, it, can, be, um, it can be hurtful and it can be helpful. And in some respects, it's going to be hurtful for teams that have, you know, good players that, want to transfer, you know, they may want to move up, or I, I, I think it could hurt even the high major schools to have a good player, like, in the, maybe there's a good mid-level player in the Big Ten, and he wants to go play at Duke, I mean, maybe Duke has four guys, or Kentucky has four guys go to the NBA each year, and now they, if they don't get the high school guys that they want, or they get a couple, what's going to keep a kid from a mid-level Big 12 school going to Duke and playing right away? You know, that's, 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 I think a lot of people think it's about, you know, uh, Tennessee. I'll use them as an example. Sure. Maybe coming and taking one of our players. And that can happen, too. But I also think it could happen the other way. And I also think it could happen where you're the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th man high major program, and you're going to be a junior or senior and you want to play. So why not come here, a place like here, go down, you know. But a lot of times those kids don't transfer because they just don't want to sit. And but they want to play. And so I think it's, I don't know, I, I think it's going to be a free-for-all. I, I really truthfully, I would probably prefer that it didn't happen, even though we've done well with transfers here, and I don't think, it, you know, I think we could probably thrive in it. I, I just think it's going to be, it would cause a lot of uh, problems. I think, I do think each year, if you, you know, re-recruiting re your team every year, and I think, I don't know if 
most coaches want to do that. I see. Now, I guess one question, what are your feelings, though, about, okay, a coach leaves and then the play, and, you know, you can coach right away at wherever. I mean, let's face it, you did interview at New Mexico this off offseason, uh, but the player, no, 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 he can't just leave if the coach leaves. Would yeah. you be in favor of a rule that says in that situation yeah. you can go anywhere and not have to sit out? Yes, I would. And I'd also, what well, I don't think it's fair, in addition to that, is if the school decides that they're not going to redo a young man's scholarship. Everybody understands these scholarships, they can be four year, they can be one year, most of them are one year. When, when, a, when an institution decides that they're not going to renew a young man's scholarship, then in, in my opinion, that young man should have the right to go anywhere he wants to play right away. I think that's wrong. You know, and and I, I, I could, I would definitely vote for that. And yeah, I, I believe I would I would agree if if a, if, a, if a coach leaves, you know, everybody, you know, the NCAA says, well, kids come because you know the institution. Nah, I don't buy that. I, I think a lot of kids in college athletes go because of the coach and the program. And I think that um, you know, if a coach does leave, then you should have the right to explore other options. I did want to ask you that you mentioned you know, could players transfer up. Now I know that you'll want to say that oh Patrick Good transferred up from Appalachian State to ETSU. Now you know that is also the Sun Belt to the uh, Southern Conference. But I'm trying to think of players that would have made uh, let's say more of a leap on the totem pole. And I was thinking of a couple just off the top of my head. I know that there was a player recently, T.J. McConnell, who, uh, yeah. well, his mother, who was the, uh, I think he was the women's basketball coach at Duquesne, and then she yeah. left. And so that T.J. McConnell left Duquesne and went to Arizona. And I also remember in the previous decade, speaking of VMI, Jason Conley was a great scorer yeah. for the Key Dets, and he went to Missouri. But, I mean, I'm not sure it's all that common uh, you know, I know you got a guy from Texas Southern. I know you'd like to think you're higher up on the uh, totem pole than Texas Southern, but you know, how often does that really happen that a guy will well, leave? I, you know, I think it happens more than it should because you know, I think what happens, I do think what happens is they do it, then they and they don't have the success that they had where they were at. And there's a good uh, Nick McDevitt at, at Asheville has lost two or three guys recently, one to Arizona, one to Louisville. I can't remember where the other kid, maybe, uh, I don't remember, but those kids, they're not, they're not having the success that they had at Asheville. Now, you know, example, there's a young man last name Murray that left Presbyterian and is at mm-hmm. Auburn right now, and now he's playing really well. Um, so it's just case by case. But I think if you look at the percentages of it, where kids transfer, quote unquote, up from a mid, low to mid to a high, I think you'll find that their success compared to what they had when they were at before would probably be minimal. Yeah, I, I, I know it, it does happen, but it doesn't happen a whole lot. And you mentioned Louisville and Arizona, and I mean, certainly those coaches have been under fire this year. But uh, let's talk about your team is going to come under fire because they're going to play the Furman Paladins with first place on the line in Greenville on Thursday. What are you looking forward to? I mean, obviously, Sibley is the guy there at uh, Furman, but uh, what else? Preparing for the Paladins, what comes to mind? What can we expect? Well, really tough team. You know, they have, they have the a lot of guys returning, a high number of guys returning from a team that shared the conference championship last year with us in Greensboro. I voted them to, to win the league because um, you can't vote for your own team. So, you know, I voted for them because I felt like they had the best nucleus of guys coming back. Now they lost their coach, went to Nico Medved, went to Drake, and he's done an incredible job with Drake, and they're winning the Valley right now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, worse the first, basically. Um as it says, it goes by Richie took the team over and um, he's done a good job with them. And I, yeah, simply is a reigning conference player of the year. He's a really hard guard, kind of like in that realm of Alonzo and, and McGee from Wofford. Just, you know, real talented guard who can handle the ball, can score at the rim, can, you know, can score at three levels from three off the drive. You know, he can pull up and shoot it. He's a really good player. But they got some other guys, you know, Rafferty and Lyons. Fowler is one of the better defenders in our league. Um, they've got a nice team. They play well at home. I think they've lost maybe one home game in the league play in the last couple of years. Since I've been here, we haven't gone there and won. Uh, and so that's a challenge in itself. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, you know, it's still early. It, it's game number six um, out of 
of 18 league games, but, you know, if you can go on the road, and, you know, and separate with wins, that's always important. He's Steve Forbes. He's got the first place team. They're going to be challenged this Thursday down in Greenville. And of course, we're always happy to have you on every week on Tri-City Sports Now to get the what's what uh, with the ETSU Buccaneers. One of the hottest teams in all of college basketball. Winners of 12 of their last 13. And, you know, he's a coach. He's still complaining about that one because when it got away from against Xavier. Well, I was too. I mean, you shouldn't be happy with just playing to Xavier. Uh, certainly Villanova wasn't. So <laughs> anyway, Tri-City Sports Now. I'll tell you where the Musketeers are ranked here because the new AP poll is coming out when we come back. Tri-City Sports Now. All right. How was that? Did you enjoy that? Always stop. Sounds good. All right. There you go. Hey, thanks for uh, everything, and it's always appreciated. Talk to you later, okay? Bye bye. From corporate parties to intimate dinners, Happy Hour Tri City Liquor is.